Welcome to all of you who are joining us online. We're always delighted that you're with us. Beautiful, beautiful morning. Only took 10 months to get here. Well, I have a, uh, a question for you, a, two, a true false question for you. I hope this works out better than what I did last week. I hope I haven't messed this one up. <laughs> so here we'll start off with a, uh, a true or false question. Is that sentence true or is it false? How many think it's true? How many think it's false? How many don't know? How many don't care? <laughs> That's kind of a, a kind of a lawyer's trick, you know. It's kind of like, do you still beat your wife? That sort of a thing. Uh, I wasn't sure exactly how to express the trueness or the falseness of it, so I asked my good friend, Chap, and uh, he came up with, a, or she, whichever it is, came up with a very good answer. It's a classic example of what is known as the liar's paradox. If the sentence is true, then what it states must be the case, so it must be false. But if it's false, then it must be true, as that's what the sentence itself states. But it creates a contradiction that is neither definitiv definitively true nor false. It's paradoxical. <clears throat> I'm not sure why I bothered with that, but I just thought it was interesting. I'm wondering, though, if we don't do some of that in our biblical interpretation. Anyway, we are ready to uh, begin a little journey with the parables. We've had maybe one or two parables so far, but now we're at a point in our chronological overview of the life of Christ where he is uh, going into a period where he's going to be really doing a lot of, of teaching, and he teaches almost uh, exclus exclusively in, uh, in parable. And what is a parable? And why would Jesus, why would Jesus choose to uh, use this particular form of didactic presentation? Who wants to just define a parable for us? You know what a parable is. It's not a trick question. A story. I'm sorry. I remember a long time ago in Bible class, I was taught it's an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Hey, good. That's a good way to describe it. Earthly story with a heavenly meaning. I like, I like that. Anybody want to get more scientific about it or <coughs> professorial about it? You're going to leave that to me, huh? All right. So what is a parable? Jesus, the great teacher, proclaims the kingdom of God. And so many of the parables begin with the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is like. If you're reading it from Matthew, it will usually be the kingdom of heaven. If you're reading it from Mark or Luke, it will usually be the kingdom of God. They are completely synonymous. I'm not sure why Matthew chose to do it a little differently. I could theorize, and this is probably not true, from a, a purely uh, Levitical standpoint, the name Yahweh was not spoken. 
it was, as you know, the, the I am word is, was not spoken at all. They would use other names like Adonai or Elohim, but they wouldn't use the sacred name. Maybe that might have influenced Matthew just to avoid the situation by using kingdom of heaven instead of invoking the name of God. I don't know. doesn't matter. But anyway, uh, by using hyperbole, warnings, laments, denunciations, beatitudes, proverbs, and dialogues, Jesus lays out over and over and over again a description of what is his core message, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, or the kingdom of God is at hand. Mm-hmm. Sure. Why don't you why don't you let hopefully why don't you let the internet hear your question also? Hopefully, hopefully it's not silly, but we're speaking of an English translation. Was the original language really that different? Or is it the interpreter who changed it? You know what I'm saying? Are you talking about in the... Whether kingdom of God or kingdom of heaven. Uh Is it the interpreter who translated it differently? No, the the Greek is... The Greek is... is Yeah, the Greek is different. Okay. Yeah. The Greek is different. Um, And again, again, it's just philosophical discussion. It has no relevance to anything Jesus is proclaiming. But of all the different ways that Jesus taught, and he used all of these. Of course, we've been through all of the Beatitudes, and we've made many references to his referring back to Proverbs and and various things. But for the most part, especially when he was addressing a crowd, not just his selected few, he resorted to parables. Uh, His Almost always his parables will draw comparisons with things that are found in nature or things that are known through human experience or things that would be very, very familiar to the audience to which he was speaking. And we'll see that over and over again. Parable is a brief, succinct narrative or allegory used to convey a moral or spiritual lesson. How did you say it? An an earthly story with a heavenly message. Term parable comes from the Greek word uh, parable. So you see it's a transliteration of the Greek. It's not an English word per se. But it means a comparison or an analogy. Jesus' parables often use familiar situations from daily life in ancient Israel. Making them accessible and relatable to the particular audience to which he was speaking. So why did he use parables? Well, for teaching. Jesus used parables as a teaching tool, embedding profound spiritual truths in very simple stories. They were intended to impart knowledge and wisdom about God's kingdom and the nature of faith. And this, you know, he said over and over again, this is my core message. The kingdom of heaven is where? It's here. It's when? It's now. And this is what it is. This is what it's like. Uh, It's a way of revelation. Parables often reveal truth about God's kingdom in ways that were not straightforward. They required contemplation and insight to understand, allowing those who genuinely seek God to grasp their deeper meanings. And we'll read a little bit later on with the disciples, the, the core group come and say, Jesus, why are you teaching in parables all the time? And he'll say, well, you all have been given the ability to understand, but these people haven't. I'm trying to help them understand. Um, there's a judgment element in them. Some parables serve to highlight the unbelief of Jesus' listeners. Uh, They were structured in such a way that their meanings were hidden from those unwilling to accept or understand Jesus' message. Uh, I think that for most of these parables, the the religious leaders of the day, the the scribes and the Pharisees, 
they heard in the parables a condemnation of their practices probably did not hear the deeper meanings at all. I'm sure they glazed over once they, it, they realized, hey, he's talking about us, and it's not good. And they left it there. He uses parables because stories are, are, are rememberable, right? We remember stories better than anything. Uh, their narrative nature and familiar settings, parables are easy to remember, uh, this ensured that the lessons they conveyed would be retained and reflected upon by those who heard them. Uh, they weren't recorded and uploaded to YouTube, so you couldn't go back six months later and say, now, what did he say about that? So they, it, it was a way that uh, they were easy to remember, and uh, they were effective because of that. And they were also engaging. By using parables, Jesus engaged his audience and challenged them to think more deeply about their beliefs and their relationships with God. Rather than simply laying out doctrines, parables invited listeners into a process of discovery and self-examination, completely antithesis to what the scribes and the Pharisees did. They wrote laws and said, you know, this is what they mean. Or this is what this guy says they mean. This is what this guy says they mean. Jesus, on the other hand, told stories and allowed people to learn from those stories the deeper lessons that were important to their life. They served a function of distinctionality. Parables also served to set apart those who were genuinely seeking the truth from those who were merely curious or hostile to Jesus' message. So you could listen to a parable on several different levels, just as the stories you were told when you were growing up, the stories your mother told you. You heard them at the level at, what you, at which you were ready to hear them at the moment. But that didn't keep them from having much deeper and richer meaning for those who were willing to put in the time and the effort to discover it. As Jesus himself explained to you, it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. And so these are ways for them to, to hear it and to remember it and to be able to recall it and to grow with it if they have the interest and the desire to do so. A little, that's a little background on, on some of the reasons why that Jesus would have chosen this particular literary style to present his core concept of the coming of the kingdom and of what it meant to be a Jesus follower. So we'll begin with uh, the first story, the story of the fig tree. And Jesus told this story. A man planted a fig tree in his garden and came again and again to see if there was any fruit on it. But he was always disappointed. Finally, he said to his gardener, I've waited three years, and there hasn't been a single fig. Cut it down. It's just taking up space in the garden. The gardener answered, Sir, give it one more chance. Leave it another year, and I'll give it special attention and plenty of fertilize the translators use the polite term fertilize. That's not the Greek. If we get figs next year, fine. If not, then you can cut it down. So what do we learn from the parable of the barren fig? Very familiar picture for the people who are hearing the parable. Not uncommon for farmers to plant fig trees in the corner of their vineyards, make use of all available space, and also to kind of set boundaries on their plot. And we'll see a little bit more of that later. Why three years? Why did he wait three years before he condemned the barren fig tree? Well, as you know, numbers usually have meanings when you're reading Scripture. 
Three, of course, symbolizes harmony. It symbolizes new life. It symbolizes completeness. There are probably other things that we could associate with the number three. There's another parallel, kind of, kind of a parallel situation, only it wasn't a parable. It was, a, it was an actual demonstration in Matthew 21. You remember when Jesus was walking along and he wanted something to eat and he saw a fig tree there and it was all blossom. It was all green everywhere. And he walked up to it and there wasn't any fruit on it and he just zapped it, withered immediately. So in the context of this parable, and Jesus is uh, condemning, obviously, the, the fruitlessness of the Jewish leaders. I think that's, that what, that's what they would have heard, first and foremost. We've been patiently waiting for you to see who I am, to hear my message, and, and you have totally, completely failed. You're not producing good fruit. You're producing division. Some of the um, things that we can glean from the parable is the patience and the expectation of, of the vineyard owner. Second Peter 3 and 9 says, God is patient, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He's waited three years here for the plant to do what the plant is supposed to do, and it hadn't done it. But there's also an element of judgment and consequence, isn't there? If after being given time and opportunity, the tree doesn't bear fruit, what then? The patience is there. God is a patient God, but he's not a forever enduring God. There comes a time of reckoning, a time of, of consequences. Redemption and intervention is there. The vineyard keeper intercedes on behalf of the tree and offers a way of escape. Now, if we think of the vineyard owner being Jesus or God, and he's the one who comes and looks and says, it's time for a reckoning. It's been three years it's gone. Cut it down. Emphatic. Definitive. Time's up. Cut it down. And then the interceder comes in and says, wait a minute. How about this? How about giving me one more chance? One more year. And what does the vineyard owner Say, okay, all right. So that kind of ring, brings us up to the question, can God change his mind? Now, if you're a Calvinist, what's the answer? No, no. no. Everything is preordained, foreordained, predestined. Nothing happens that God hasn't already planned. God is immutable, unchangeable, the same yesterday, today, and forever. He cannot change his mind. Millions of people believe that today. But the parable would seem to say differently. Well, actually, the entire Bible seems to say differently. If God cannot change his mind, if God will not change his mind, if God cannot be convinced by a petitioner, you, me, then why in the world would we pray? Why in the world would we evangelize? 
because everybody's fate's already sealed. It's a very, very strange, very, very strange doctrine in my mind. But uh, it's also a very pr prominent one. Also embedded in this, of course, is the, the idea of personal responsibility. Um, what's the final resolution of this? The tree has to produce. If it produces, it lives. If it doesn't produce, it dies. So I guess if we wanted to look for a practical ac uh, uh, application for our own lives, we would have to ask, am I producing fruit? How many years will God be patient with me while the Holy Spirit waters and fertilizes before he gives up? What kind of fruit am I producing? And I, I think, and this is just me, but I think that in the Christian walk, if we want to use the fig tree as a, an illustration, the crop ought to be an increasing crop. I think that if we are, some people, as you know, are, are Christians for one year 20 times. Some people are 20-year Christians. You understand the difference in that? If we are today where we were last year in our spirituality and in our walk with Christ, in our productive lifestyle, then are we doing what God has called us to do? Or should we be growing, sinking roots deeper, producing more fruit today than we did a year ago or 10 years ago. Here's the uh, pulpit commentary summary on, on this particular parable. It says the period represented by this last year included the preaching of John the Baptist, the public ministry of Jesus Christ, and the 40 years of apostolic teaching which followed the crucifixion and resurrection. The last chance was given but in the vine dresser's prayer to the Lord of the vineyard, there is scarcely a ray of hope. And of course, here what they're referring to is the Jews completely rejected Jesus' message. And because they rejected Jesus' message, because they did not produce the fruit that they were called upon to produce, it ended up with the destruction of, of the Jewish nation in AD 70. I don't know that that's what Jesus had in his mind when he gave this parable, but as we look back through the lens of history, we can see that turned out to be the case. Any other thoughts on the parable of the barren fig tree that anybody would care to, uh, to add to that? Or is that more than you ever wanted to know already? All right, we have now uh, an example of a, of a miracle uh, taking place. Uh, on one Sabbath day, as Jesus was teaching in the synagogue, he saw a woman who had been crippled by an evil spirit. She had been bent double for 18 years and was unable to stand up straight. It sounds like a really severe case of Scoliosis, but uh, Luke accredits it to uh, an evil spirit, and uh, Luke was a physician, so I give credibility to his diagnosis. But here is this woman uh, in the in the synagogue. Um, I I was a little confused about that, and did a little bit of research on it. Uh, I had kind of had it in my mind that, that women were excluded from being in the synagogue during times of teaching, but that's not true, uh, unless somebody knows something different. But my sources indicated that they, they were excluded from temple. There was a, a 
courted the women at the Temple Mount, but they weren't allowed in the temple itself. But uh, they were allowed in synagogue. And uh, apparently this woman, in spite of her inflictions, was someone who was very devout. And uh, she was there as Jesus was teaching. We're kind of getting to the point in Jesus' life now where he's not going to be welcome in most of the synagogues. But at this particular occasion, he's still teaching in the synagogue. So here she comes in, and he sees her. And when Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, Dear woman, you are healed. Some translations say you are set free of your sickness. Then he touched her, and instantly she could stand straight. How she praised, how she glorified God. Why would she not? What a wonderful blessing. What did you notice about this, though? What was the first thing you noticed about this? What day was it? Sabbath. I believe <laughs> the, re- the leading rulers, the, the leader of the synagogue, the ruler of the synagogue, and, and that could be really anybody, but it was whoever was responsible for taking care of that particular building. They were the worship leader. They were the one that organized everything, made, maintained the building. They were the leader, usually a Pharisee or a, a scribe. Uh, anyway, he was indignant that Jesus had healed her on the Sabbath day. There are six days of the week for working, he said to the crowd. Come on those days to be healed, not on the Sabbath. I, I, I kind of have an idea that Jesus looked for opportunities to heal on the Sabbath. It happened a lot. And he always knew, of course, the response he was going to get. And he intentionally did it anyway. The Lord replied, you hypocrites, each of you works on the Sabbath day. Don't you untie your ox or your donkey from its stall on the Sabbath and lead it out for water? This dear woman, a daughter of Abraham, has been held in bondage by Satan for 18 years. Isn't it right that she be released even on the Sabbath? This shamed his enemies, but all the people rejoiced or were delighted at the wonderful things that he did. Very typical response. The oral Torah um, allowed physicians to act uh, on the Sabbath, to to perform uh, medicine on the Sabbath, but only in the case of an emergency, a life-threatening emergency. Uh, If it was a chronic illness like this woman had, uh, they were strictly forbidden. As we've talked about several times in these situations where Jesus heals on the Sabbath, just one of an endless and changing set of Sabbath work rules. Uh, Exodus 20 and 10 says, don't work on the Sabbath. And the Pharisees took that one little phrase and they created 39 different categories of what that meant. And then they developed an almost endless litany of rules to govern those 39 categories. If you, and after, about maybe around 200 A.D., most of the oral laws got put down in writing. And you can go on the Internet and read it now. That's the Mishnah, the Talmud and the Mishnah. And I went one time and and started to just read what the, the Talmud has to say about the rules governing working on the Sabbath. Just that one, you know, out of 613 laws, this is just one of them. It's voluminous. And, I mean, it's just chapters long. And it's, according to this rabbi, it means this. According to this rabbi, it means this. And it just, if, if you're having trouble sleeping, I recommend it. It'll put you right out. And that's what Jesus was confronting. And that's what just drove him crazy. 
That's why he keeps saying, you hypocrites, don't do that. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat. He did that on at least one other, maybe two other occasions, once in Luke 5. And he sat in it while all the people stood on the shore. So now we're coming to the parable of the sower. And this is one of the more famous, well-known, studied parables of Jesus. Uh, there, there may be five or six that really stand out more than the others. This one in the parable of the Good Samaritan and uh, a few like that. But um, it's a pretty simple parable, really. And it's one of those, and he doesn't do it often, but this is one of the ones where Jesus gives a parable and then he gives the explanation. He explains exactly what the parable means, and he does that to his disciples. But there are some, uh, some very uh, deep uh, lessons that are also to be gleaned. I found a little uh, video on, on YouTube um, that kind of puts this parable into its first century context. And I did a little editing on it, so it's not quite as long as it was on YouTube, so it might be a little bit choppy. But um, I thought I would start with it, and then we'll get into the... Uh, into the text itself. Early in his ministry, Jesus stood in a boat on the Sea of Galilee and gave his first major parable, the parable of the sower. This powerful parable teaches us of the importance of being prepared to receive the word and to be fruitful to the Lord. The setting of the story is quite remarkable. Jesus had just left Capernaum, located north of the Sea of Galilee. As he began teaching, a large group of people gathered on the shore. Because of the growing crowd, Jesus climbed into a boat and began to teach so everyone would be able to hear. Though we don't know the exact location, the traditional site is called the Cove of the Sower and has been identified because of the naturally created acoustics. Still to this day, if one stands on the edge of the shore, one's voice can be carried to great distances. To the Savior's audience at the time, this parable of a sower planting seeds would have been a familiar story. Most of his listeners would have personally planted and harvested crops for their entire life. Planting and harvesting techniques have changed significantly over the past 2,000 years, which can lead to misinterpretations. With this in mind, let's get our hands a little dirty, so to speak, and learn about ancient farming. Many farmers in ancient Israel did not own their own land. Rather, they would receive an annual stewardship of a plot assigned to them by the local leadership. Each individual farmer would mark their plot of land, not with a fence as is common today, but rather by some sort of a land marker, such as a tree, a pile of rocks, or other notable feature. Without fencing, little paths would be used so farmers could access their pieces of land. This is likely what Jesus refers to as the first type of soil, where the seeds fall on the paths and are eaten by the birds. Jesus tells us that this represents those who hear the word, but because they don't understand, the evil one takes away the seeds that had been planted in their heart. After the previous crops were harvested, the fields were then burned. This put the ash and other minerals back into the soil. Animals would then be allowed to roam the land, rummaging for food, leaving behind manure, and thus fertilizing the soil. In such an arid climate, the hot sun would bake the ground and manure, leaving behind hard, cracked soil. While Israel is dry throughout much of the year, with almost no rain from May to October, when it does rain, it pours. In fact, Jerusalem receives about the same amount of rain as London, but in less than half the number of days. This rain falls predominantly during two seasons, known as the former, or early rains, and the latter rains. The early rains begin in November and December, softening the soil so that the seeds can be planted and the land can be tilled. 
The latter rains come in March and early April, nourishing the planted crops, with the harvest of barley coming at Passover around March or April, and the harvest of wheat at the Feast of Weeks in May or June. Unlike modern farming, when crops are watered using ditches, flood irrigation, or sprinklers, anciently most farmers in Israel practiced what is known as dry farming, with rain as the only source of moisture. This means that it was crucial to plant crops during the rainy season. It also meant that to preserve as much water as possible in the soil, rocks were often left on the ground providing both shade and places where the water could pool. This is very different from early American and European farming, where rocks were removed from the fields and used to build the fences around the property. This would likely be what Jesus was referring to for the second type of soil, the rocky ground. It represents those who initially receive the word with joy, but because they have no root, when times of trouble come, their joy proves to be short-lived and they fall away. Once the soil was softened by rain, the farmer first cast the seeds on the ground. Next, animals were used to pull a plow to till the land and mix the seeds into the soil. Because the seeds are sown before the land is plowed, they might fall upon thorny ground or where weeds and thistles grow. These unwelcome plants choke out the growing seeds by taking the light and water. The thorny ground represents those who hear the word, but let the cares of the world and the deceit of wealth choke out the word, and thus never become fruitful. And finally, we learn of the seeds that fall in moist, fertile soil. The good soil represents those who hear and embrace the word. It is they who can produce a crop which yields many more seeds than used to sow, yielding as much as 30, 60, or even 100 times the original number of seeds planted. This powerful parable, as one can imagine, can have multiple meanings or interpretations. The sower can represent God or those authorized who act on his behalf. The seed, Jesus tells us, is the word. This could be the gospel of Jesus Christ or even the Savior himself, for he tells us, I am the Word. As we read the parable of the sower, we might ask, where do the words of Christ fall in our lives? Do they fall on trampled paths, rocky soil, thorny ground, or good soil? In Ephesians, we are encouraged to let the Word of Christ take root in the fertile ground of our hearts, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Well, I think that um, many times we're probably tempted to maybe go beyond what Jesus actually is intending his audience to hear. Uh, we, we push parables pretty far sometime. And that's not necessarily bad. I, I think, you know, it kind of comes back to the idea of exegesis versus eisegesis. There's the exegesis. This is what Jesus meant when he said it to the audience to which he spoke. And then there's eisegesis is how can we take that without compromising context and draw modern day applications for us. So we do some of that and I think that, that that's not a bad thing to do. So we come to the text. <clears throat> then he told, many, told them many things in parables saying a farmer went out to sow his seeds. And of course, this parable is presented in, in all three of the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, so this is kind of a composite of all of those. As he was scattering the seeds, some, feed, some fell along the path and the birds came and ate it. Some fell on the rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. 
But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil where it produced a crop, some a hundred, some sixty, some thirty times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let them hear. Now, Jesus went on from here in the, in the uh, context of the uh, narrative uh, to uh, talk about some other things. And then his disciples came and asked him to explain to them what the parable meant. So I'm going a little bit uh, out of sequence, but I'm jumping right into Jesus' explanation to the uh, parable to his disciples. Listen to then what listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their hearts. This is the seed sown along the path. The seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy, but since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. But the seed falling on the good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop yielding 160 or 30 times what was sown. So that's the, the text of it. Um, there are several things that I think we can, can draw from this. I, th- I think, you know, the, the, the overall gist of the parable is, is pretty apparent, wouldn't you say? I mean, I mean, he explains it. It is what he says it is. We can't argue with that. I mean, it's his to explain. But maybe we can uh, pull from it uh, a few other things that might be um, not as apparent to us, and we, I think we saw some of that maybe in the, the video where it looked more in-depth at the uh, times and the place where it occurred, and then some things that might be relevant to us in our uh, more modern application of it. So uh, we're rapidly approaching the end of our time here. I don't want to get into that uh, today, and we will uh, pick up there, Lord willing, and our next opportunity. And uh, thank you for your presence and your attention and uh, enjoy this uh, beautiful weather while it lasts and uh, have a wonderful God-blessed week.